So let me begin how I started this journey, because I didn't even know what paternity arms were until about five or six months ago. My friend Roger, my client, he asked me to do some data analysis in the stock market, and I can't tell you what the stocks are exactly, that's proprietary. But he had the rates of changes of, over time of four raw materials on, the, on their stock indexes. And we wanted to see if we could predict the rates of changes to the four commodities that were most directly tied to them a month later. And it led me down to a, uh, a quite an interesting to stop just learning about the turning on solutions. So let me explain how it happened. First, I tried to do a real number function four input changes onto one input change, four inputs onto the second chain, four inputs onto the whatever. But when I looked at it, the R squared values were actually relatively high, but the pattern of residual that they left for strange angles looking like solar flares coming off the sun and stuff, I went, hmm, maybe there's like a complex number type relationship. I learned how to do complex least squares. And all these strange residuals, they were still there, but now they were smoother. I went, is there a type of complex number that goes beyond the complex numbers? And I looked that up and I found that gentleman's video that was just here, blue three, blue one, brown. I went, oh, that's very interesting. You have paternions. That took me down the rabbit hole for the next five to six months of that video. So then, um, what ended up happening was, I found the closed form solution to paternity on IP squares. And this is useful not just for my client, but for what the gentleman had here earlier on quantum computing. He was looking for the linear regression in the form of B null, some constant quaternion on, plus B1, a vector, uh, another quaternion on, times his qubit strain equals his output strain. And he was using a reiterative re uh, function to converge on not the best possible solution, but just on a good one. I have a closed form solution that just tells you the absolute best answer, period. It's actually very, very similar to ordinary least squares. The difference is that we're going to use the conjugate block transpose of our design matrix, <coughs> also respecting left and right handed paternity on priorities, depending on which side you multiply it by. So let's go ahead and look at some of these slides here. Just so click. the first thing I noticed is uh, one of the first videos I came to from the Quaternion on Agoda Society, Roger, I don't know how to make this work. Right click on the tablet. So just go to the next slide. And the next thing that I noticed, the first thing I uh, found was a video by Justin Sawson, right here in this room in 2018 on Quaternion on Agoda. And I thought, well, perhaps if I followed his line of work and the references in his paper, I would find a solution that would turn it on at least squares. I did. There was no closed form solution anywhere. I couldn't usually find everything on it, and I couldn't find this one. Anyway, I started looking at things, and now what I want to talk about is what can we use with turning on at least squares for possible? I'm not saying we can't, speculation. Before I show you the answer, how do you do this? So here's a table of, fund of many of the fundamental concepts of nature. Does anybody want to say what just might be wrong with that entire table? It's not quaternionized. Yeah, it's all real numbers. Yeah. You're telling me there's not a single <laughs> constant of nature? That's not a complex number. Or a quaternion or whatever. This is the leader of the two groups. Right. So, Left, right -click. left click on the tablet. Okay. Got there it. was a paper. The last you've done you've done three or four. I know. Okay. I'll come back. To that. I, <laughs> I don't have enough time to go through more. So there was a paper written by um, three scientists. Okay. If I can find it, we didn't put the slide on. But they were asking for uh, they were physicists. They were looking for the uh, solution to. Given two inputs, x and y, and an output z, the x was the properties of an electron, y was the properties of a positron, and z was some output, I don't know what it was they were doing, but they were looking for a solution in the form of x times some constant beta times y equals z. Why were they looking for this? Because it's 
such a beta exists, it's such a turning on a constant exists, so that mediated the relationship between a positron and electron in their laboratory, and then there would be a particle that treated matter differently from antimatter. Fortunately, they did not find a solution. Now, this is a paper here, I'm not going to discuss this, by Victor Ariel from Israel, and he starts describing quaternionic space time. And he does so well that he derives the Lorentz transformation no, just one straight from the quaternion, just by writing time is the real scalar and three dimensional space as the imaginary unit vector. The Lorentz transformation is implicit. We're not here to talk about that. What we're talking about is how can we verify this man's claim? What data can I collect? and measure to see if he's right. And how would I measure it other than with with turning on least squares? Now we're going to go to that solution. So some basic definitions. Okay. The first uh, thing that I uh, differ from here, oh, here's their paper. So I mentioned this was there, these three Chinese scientists given three quaternionic lists, data list A, B, and an observation E, quaternionic least squares. They went through a method that was, again, very similar to what the gentleman had earlier, okay, with trying to approximate their way towards the best solution, okay? Now, let's move on. The one difference I have between you and others, though, when it comes to quaternions, is I don't have a scalar part. I have a forward vector q. Forward times forward is forward. I times I is left times left, which is behind you. Backwards, negative q. The moment we write q as the forward vector, things start to make a lot more sense. Okay? Now, that's my K-Lake table for the quaternions. Now, let's move to the next slide. Each, when you multiply A times B, if quaternion on A is on the left, you're going to rewrite it as a real number, four by four matrix in this form, and multiply it by the common vector of B. If A is on the right, we use this form, and we multiply A in this form, this matrix times a common vector of B. The right and left handed forms are absolutely crucial when turning on at least squares. You cannot ignore them. Okay, next slide. So, these are just basic lemmas that most of you already know. I don't think I need to talk about them. But if you write A equals, uh, let's see what we have. If C equals AB, okay? then A is equal to B times the inverse matrix of B for right. Things like this. I have better, cleaner notations these days of this. And same thing, left-handed division. If you have C equals AB, then I have vector B is the inverse matrix of four left times returning on C. But now to answer the question of the Chinese scientists, what happens when you have C equals AXB? Okay? What you do here is you multiply C, it doesn't matter which order you do it, you're going to first multiply C by the inverse matrix of B4 right, then you're going to multiply that by the inverse matrix again of A4 left. That will yield the variable in the middle, X that they seek in their least squares regression once we do the sums. Okay, now, um, we probably skip this slide. Okay, we don't want to skip, it's actually very important for these squares. So now, let's say we have not just two data points, but n data points C. I have n equals 500, I have C1 to C500 equals A1 to A500 times X times B1 to B500. Turns out that if you multiply these matrices, A left, four right, directly, 
and then multiply them by x, it's still equal to the sum of all c equals the sum of these matrices multiplied against each other, where you take the direct entry-wise sum times x. Okay. So go to the next slide. So now, we're, before we do least squares, we're going to do a quaternionic system of linear equations. So we have six variables. We have six constants, x1, x2, x3, x4, the six that we want to derive. And we have six different data lists, a1 to an, well in this case six, b1, b6, c1, c6, d1, all the way out to h. The way we solve for x, because these are all, are some of these left-handed? Okay, so all of my x are on the left, on the left side. So I'm going to replace a1, okay, with the inverse matrix of a1. For first, I'm going to replace all a, b, c, d from a1 to h6 with their right-handed matrix form. So we're going to have a four by four block matrix. All of these convert to a four by four block matrix of a to h6. You now invert that entire matrix, multiply it by this 1 by 4 block vector from W1 to W6, and out pops a column vector from X1 to X6. And these need not be all on the left or the right or anything. If these X3s were on the right, then you just replace all your Cs with right-handed matrices, and it still works. And let's say we had X4, D5, Y4, X times D times Y. Well, then you just replace all of these with x from the left times y from the right, and then you invert the whole matrix again, and you'll still yield your constants. In this case, you'll be yielding your d constants on x. So we have a way that I know through experimentation uh, will give you a perfect r squared one solution. You can solve any linear system equations so long as that inverse matrix is invertible. Okay, now let's go to the closed form. So I want to jump right to the end here. So here, what my client needed for one of the data sets was Z was the output vector, Xi was each data point X, Y times Y2, and Xi3 was the third list. And we needed a form in the output equals x, y times some constant b1, the two data lists y multiplied by b in the middle, plus b from the right, uh, left, times the third data list. So the least square matrix comes in this form. Four left times four left, because x is on the left there, we're trying to get b1. So we multiply x by its conjugate to get a real number sum of magnitude squares for all our data points from 1 to n. We then multiply this entire equation by x1 conjugate, x1 conjugate, and our output variable by x1 conjugate. We then multiply this equation again and again by uh, right, it's actually written there, matrices G and G conjugate are given by data lists Y1 and Y2, left and right times each other, and con that's just a conjugate Y2 over there. You multiply that through, times X1, times this conjugate itself gives you another real number, so on and so forth. That conjugate matrix signs your, your output vector. You do it one more time, you're gonna take the third data list, multiply it through by its conjugate now from the right side, because our third data point is on the right. Now I have the design matrix signs the conjugate block transpose of itself equals the conjugate block transpose signs the output vector. Invert this entire matrix, this would be a 12 by 12 matrix, invert it, multiply it by that column vector, and out pops B1, B2, B3. 
And the results, as you're about to see, now the actual equation was a cubic quaternionic manifold. And I'm going to show you the result of this equation with these inputs, how well I can predict the Q, I, J, K parts of the output vector. Okay? I hate this one. <laughs> Just the button. <laughs> this is how well I was able, I had to react the data for my client. This is how well I was able to predict the percentage change in these commodities based on the change in their raw material prices a month prior. So you have four commodities of what was the percentage change for each one a month later. This is how well I could predict each component of that vector. That's how I know I got the right solution. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, the last thing I want to show you real quick, and this is something the other gentleman just mentioned, there are more algebras beyond the quaternions, so as which you know are the octonians and sedenians. But sometimes my client needs more than four numbers for me to predict right now. Sometimes you need six or eight. Now, some of you have heard of the octonians, but have any of you ever heard of the hexonians? Trigging the duonians? Long story short, the way I know that they actually exist is that I can take the end of the root of n and unity, add the device, subtract, multiply, take their logarithm, and do exponentiation with them. And the least squares with them using their six left and six right faults. So I know that they exist. Uh, whatever octonians that the uh, academics are using today, there's something fundamentally wrong with it. Because when I looked it up on Wikipedia, I could not get the end of root of n unity of an octonian. I can using this table up. Just want to bring that up real quick. And we can go further. So I'm no longer writing letters, I'm writing dimension numbers. This is the Sedenians. And just for fun, I ran over a formula to pump out the letters. This is a 22 dimensional hypercomplex number. This tells you the dimension number from 1 to 22. This is the K link table. This tells you the output dimension and the sine positive negative. And if you write this in any other way, you switch any two conjugate signs, you switch any two numbers anywhere. It no longer works. You can't do that with roots of unity. You can't do least squares. You can't do anything. But if you write it just in that form, they work like any other number. Now we can predict 22 stock prices at a time. All right, now, is there anything else here? Oh, yes. Somebody mentioned a Mogi. Is the man who just mentioned Mogi's uh, transformation still here? Oh, he would have wished to say. Turns out there's also odd dimensional hypercomplex numbers. However, their K lay tables have to be written QIJKM times their backwards conjugate. Remember the guy had the he knows his numbers were backwards and negative in the previous presentation. Plus, well, suppose there's a five-dimensional system that explains a Klein bob, a quaternion with double half twists in this form. What you'll notice is that the squares of half the dimensions are positive, not negative. So we have i squared, i times i times negative i is positive q, which means i times positive i is negative q or negative 1. q is always my forward vector. But what you'll notice here is this negative number. It says k times negative k is negative q. Yes? Just one more minute. Okay, well, this is the last slide. Oh, okay. In other words, when you have a odd dimensional logic, half of its imaginary numbers, when square, are positive positive 1. And that's what makes them non oriented. But you can still do n of roots of n unity, least squares, and everything else. That's what I have to show you today. And anybody that wants me to give them some of the solutions to some of this stuff, I am here for you. And by the way, there is a closed form quadratic and cubic and quarter solution to <laughs> turning on a polynomial degree two, three, and four. That's what I got to say. Thank you.
Explain a little more about the, you know, we start with disjoint sets. Oh, and, and we're, we're. When you're, if anybody wants to use this for data analysis, whether it's marking data, scientific data, whatever, it's very important that if you have disjoint, let's say you have a uh, population, if you split that into men and women, you cannot start mixing it with quaternionic data. So, for instance, let me give you a real easy example. This is what you can do with quaternionic. I have 500 people. 250 men, women of the matter split. What percentage of men bought a Mustang? That's your real part. What percentage of those men then chose them the color black? That's your imaginary part. What chose four wheel drive or whatever? That you can write as a quaternion. But when you do women, you cannot mix that with the men. So because men are making the same choice in the same group, you can now write it as a complex number. Whereas you cannot mix men and women together. That's because they're disjoint sets, so you wouldn't, whatever. But anyway, I'll ask him more later. Thank you so much, Edward. No that problem. Was really good. Thank you. Take your laptop. I get it. Oh.